So this is um, based on a, 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 a handbook uh, article that I recently wrote, but it's expanded by in a number of different directions, recent work that I've done. Um, it focuses on uh, the, this notion of uh, boost, and uh, in particular, it focuses on how um, we uh, made the, uh, we drew the distinction and the motivation, the why, why we think that this distinction um, is uh, of relevance. So um, let me start. I'm not sure to what extent you're familiar with the debate on behavioral public policy. Let me start with that a little bit and give you sort of a broader introduction into uh, those categorizations. Um, and then uh, uh, focus on the distinction between uh, boosts and nudges. And then uh, in the second half of the talk, I will give you to or exp exp uh, um, expand a little bit on the reasons, two reasons in particular. The one is um, basically um, positive in the sense of that we're interested in measuring effect sizes of interventions more um, precisely than we could before. And the second one is normative, um, is questions of ethical assessment. Um, and I'll here, I'll use the particular case, which is by itself broad enough, of uh, debating, evaluating, assessing whether uh, certain types of uh, behavioral public policy are less autonomy reducing than others. So um, behavioral public policies are uh, interventions by a policymaker that can be uh, the pub, uh, a public uh, agent, but it can also be a company. Uh, it might sometimes even be um, uh, private individuals who uh, intervene on friends or partners or uh, something like that. Um, and they um, have uh, various traditional tools at their hands. One is um, to coerce in the sense of um, either literally forcing uh, people to uh, do something or to uh, put them in situations that clearly is perceived as uh, forcing their hands. So um, uh, think of uh, offering someone a deal they cannot refuse. Um, of uh, movie fame, that's a sort of, they in principle have a choice, but the choice is clearly so unacceptable that they're, that we would consider that coercion. Um, and uh, an alternative traditional instrument, or kind of traditional instrument is uh, to provide incentives. And typically those would be to uh, maybe um, uh, reduce uh, the price or impose a fine or uh, reduce taxes, things like that. In addition to these two broad types, um, uh, some authors have introduced, or some authors, I should say, Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein in the, uh, in the began uh, publishing on this in the late 1990s. Um, have uh, proposed to introduce a third category where the policymaker can make use of what they in the first the case described negatively as non-coercive, non-incentivizing um, interventions with the goal of changing behavior. Uh, so the goal is very clear. It's not educational. It's not sort of like uh, making you better people, but it's about changing behavior. Um, as would coercion or incentives, but it's now done in ways that uh, is different from these two. And that's why uh, this dividing of the pie uh, might uh, seem quite plausible. Now, if you look into the definition that they give in uh, their book, Nudge, um, it actually is not so obvious um, uh, or it's not, it's not, I would say it's not a very precise definition. Uh, we don't have to go through detail here, but what is important is um, 
that um, the main focus is on what they call the choice architecture. So they intervene in the context, the environment of uh, uh, people's uh, choices. Um, then comes this uh, non-coercive, non-incentivizing uh, non part, um, and um, that uh, it furthermore must there must there sort of also a so what might be called a liberty constraint. So people must be able to opt out of it relatively easily with a, without actually specifying what relatively easily or easily or cheaply might actually mean. Um, for those of you who have read uh, maybe uh, some of this literature, um, I think it's quite obvious that many of the examples that they themselves uh, then give here in this book and elsewhere often don't match. Uh, this definition um, that also there have been a lot of um, important differences uh, between such interventions have been sh uh, shown or discussed. So there's been um, a, a fair amount of attempts to give a more precise definition of what nudges really are. I'm just citing some of the recent literature here. Um, not many of them are uh, uh, philosophers, but by uh, not all, not all. So there are there are also uh, psychologists, health psychologists, political scientists, and economists um, involved uh, in these attempts to improve uh, definitions. So you see, this is sort of an ongoing uh, concern. We want to improve um, the concept of nudge. One thing that I have always been a little bit worried about is that it often isn't clear why we want a better definition. Huh? So it seems like, okay, maybe it's uh, for philosophers, that question doesn't really arise. It seems like we always want better, clearer, more precise definitions, then that's a value and it's on its own. But um, I felt that uh, one should be more specific about what the goals are when trying to define or characterize uh, such uh, concepts. So for me, um, what I, I've tried to describe this as a practice-oriented approach to uh, the definition or the definitional question. Huh? So if I want to define or redefine uh, the concept of nudge, um, or maybe categorize different types of behavioral public policies, then what I'm trying to do is to identify the most relevant roles that such categories uh, play in the public domain. And uh, then, they, so by having identified these functions, then try to sort of adjust the definitions or the categorization in such a way uh, that uh, these concepts can work. These, these policies uh, can perform these functions better. And um, what I what I what the the work on distinguishing nudges and boosts is based on is to identify two such um, roles, uh, two important roles that these concepts play. One is in uh, the extrapolation. Uh, so um, the uh, problem, here is, uh, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll describe that in more detail later, but the, the issue here is that we are, um, uh, we are experimenting or we are observing um, uh, the effects uh, or the performance of such policies in particular contexts. And then we wanna use that evidence in order to justify the application of such policies in different contexts. So we're extrapolating from one context to the other. And in that moment, we need to form uh, categories. Uh, we need to say, well, so this, this thing that we're extrapolating is of the same kind and the differences in context don't matter for this kind or they don't. So therefore we can apply uh, the evidence uh, from um, uh, the original you know, context. And the second issue is uh, the normative assessment. That is, we are asking, um, is it morally or maybe politically acceptable to um, apply such and such um, uh, uh, intervention in a particular context? So if we start with the normative assessment, there is a substantial literature by now on nudges. 
that uh, tends to sort of separate into two camps. So one um, tends to uh, give a universal assessment. So that's sort of, there are people who defend nudges, and then there are people who are uh, generally critical of nudges. Um, and um, that criticism is based on a wide range of um, of, uh, of uh, normative dimensions, like, for example, uh, liberty or dignity, questions of manipulation, of transparency, of autonomy, and so on. And then there's the other camp that says, oh, but we're going to be careful. This is all going to be, ultimately, the assessment depends on the specifics of the context. And um, we cannot make this general claim. Um, so, I'm generally more um, sympathetic to this particularist view. I do not believe um, that, uh, that a general assessment of nudges um, can be had. Um, but at the same time, um, one has to, I mean, uh, Luke Bowens here is not so clear, and I, I believe I'm not in disagreement with him, even though I think the formulation is, is a little bit funny. Um, insofar as that we, again, will need categorization. Uh, we cannot just do assessment of particulars. Uh, we, need to, um, we need to identify that a certain uh, uh, implementation of a particular intervention falls into, a, into some category, and that will allow us uh, to then draw a number of uh, moral or political conclusions but we need to perform uh, this categorization at some point. So categorization uh, somewhere is needed. And this combines with the problem that I think is very interesting, I've written about myself, um, that uh, often normative assessment requires procedural information. So we often cannot decide merrily in the outcome of an intervention, behavioral intervention, whether it is morally acceptable um, or not, but rather we will need to know something about the procedures. So here's the first time where I think uh, this idea of a procedure, a process, or a mechanism comes in um, that I will uh, spend now much more time on discussing. The other uh, function, as, you, as I briefly have mentioned, is that of extrapolation. So we are uh, observing an effect of a kind of intervention in uh, one kind of environment. Now we want to uh, predict uh, or justify the application of the same kind of intervention in a different environment. And the problem is that the effect sizes that we find uh, in most of the published literature are uh, tend to be extremely context sensitive. So even um, when you look at uh, now um, widely available uh, reviews and uh, meta-analyses, you see that the effect sizes range over a often staggering um, uh, range. Yeah? So we hear uh, the one uh, that concerns uh, feedback um, on uh, household energy consumption, we find that, well, some of these experiment show uh, an, a, a substantial positive effect, while others seem to have a negative effect. Uh, so what do you make of that? Huh? I mean, the, the meta-analysis makes very little of that. It sort of averages over it, which is not a particularly um, satisfying uh, solution, I think. So I think that uh, altern the alternatives must be found, and I think the alternatives lie in um, being more precise about in what, in which ways, systematically specific contextual factors can influence uh, the uh, effect size, and we need to find out more about this. Well, how do we do that? The argument is: well, we find out by more explicitly investigating the mechanisms uh, through which such uh, interventions operate. So, if we a mechanism here, simply put consists in, uh, uh, in inter uh, treatment T, um, the intervention, you do something to a group of people, say you give them feedback, regular feedback on their mobile phones about their 
uh, weekly energy consumption. And at the end of uh, is a chain um, of factors uh, lies uh, their behavior. Uh, so you're somehow affecting their behavior. That, and and the, uh, the, uh, the literature typically um, reduces this to only a connection between T and uh, B, right? So that we, we intervened on T or we implemented T and then now look what we get. We get a certain change uh, in behavior. Well, there are clearly these um, uh, interventions operate through a number of uh, uh, intermediary factors. Um, that uh, in the literature are often not called mediators. These mediators can be lots of things. They can be, typically there will be in the first place, individual cognitive uh, factors, people perceiving, uh, exper experiencing, evaluating um, uh, the intervention in certain ways, but there can also be social aspects like people talking to each other about this and sort of and arriving at a consensus or uh, sticking with a disagreement and so on. Um, and these mediators now are themselves subject to influence from uh, the context in which these decisions are taken. Huh? So um, I'm perceiving um, uh, uh, a regular feedback from um, uh, about my my weekly consumption, um, energy consumption, in different ways depending on whether I'm, for example, exposed to a lot of distracting information. If I'm someone who uh, who never managed to uh, avoid spam, um, and therefore I'm just I'm. I'm inundated with uh, all kinds of messages every day, I probably will perceive reminders from the policymaker in a very different way than if I'm someone who has meticulously avoided uh, such uh, massive amount of messaging. And therefore there, there will only be the very occasional ping uh, on my phone. Uh, so uh, this is a very trivial example of something that we call a moderate. Uh, my perception is of the of the intervention uh, is moderated by uh, certain contextual factors that I'm uh, I'm in, and these moderators can either switch off or reduce the uh, operation or the transmission of uh, the intervention on in this causal chain to my behavior, or they can amplify. And furthermore, such mediators themselves might also have side effects. Uh, so uh, if, for example, you the, the policymaker, um, as a matter of course, lies to me about certain, uh, about, about certain uh, questions in order to change my behavior, um, it is not, and, and, and I find out about this, um, it might, I might well learn, I might, I might well conclude that uh, the policymaker generally is an, is an unreliable source of information and I'll behave, I'll, I'll change my behavior in different, uh, accordingly. But this is something that I, uh, that I hear uh, represent as these kinds of side effects. So mechanisms help us to identify um, in the first place, through which mediators uh, interventions uh, affect behavior. And in the second place, importantly, they help us to identify which contextual factors act as moderators on such change and therefore have an uh, either amplifying or preventing um, uh, influence on um, the strength of the intervention. And furthermore, they also allow us to identify various side effects. Um, and that can that that this is relevant, uh, I think, uh, shows even in uh, the uh, empirical literature. So what we've done is to look at um, the uh, literature on um, energy consumption and intervention nudges specifically on energy consumption, and um, what you find is that the literature always categorizes these interventions by their treatments. 
Um, and what we find is that the mechanisms and the treatments, they don't, they don't map onto each other very easily. Yeah? So here are some examples. So um, some nudges operate through uh, a commitment intervention. That is, you're uh, making people, you're offering people the opportunity to commit to a certain saving goal. Uh, so you, you go to them and you say, would you be willing to sign this pledge to reduce your energy consumption in the next six months over, let's say, 10%? Um, or uh, they might operate through uh, feedback where they, uh, where they give regular um, uh, feedback on, uh, on weekly or daily, weekly or monthly consumption. Or uh, they might provide social comparison where they give feedback not only on individual consumption, but they also say, and, the, and, and your individual consumption stands in comparison to the average um, of your peer group uh, in the following way. Yeah, so you're sort of, you're consuming more than two thirds of your peers, something like that. And this is how we generally find uh, that uh, such intervention are categorized by the into by the treatment or treatment handle, I want to call it. And now we looked at um, uh, attempts to explain what makes these individual these these different types work. And there we find multiple mechanistic hypotheses. Uh, so um, we find that, for example, commitment um, treatments are explained through at least three different uh, mechanistic hypotheses. Um, similarly, social comparison um, and uh, feedback at least by two different uh, such mechanistic hypotheses. So what, what, without, there's very little evidence at this point, uh, empirical evidence that sort of shows that uh, interventions operate through certain mechanisms, but there are definitely these different mechanistic hypotheses around. And that, I think, shows that um, we must be careful in identifying, I mean, what we, if we now stick with the treatment as the categorization tool, then we're bunching together another, a, a number of different mechanisms. And according to the argument I just gave before, um, we therefore buy into a necessary form, uh, necessary ways how to uh, get a, a, a substantial contextual uh, sensitivity, right? Because we are not separating out what the in the, the respective moderators might be uh, for these uh, interventions. Uh, we're bunching them together, and the, we shouldn't be surprised um, to get a lot of sensitive uh, context sensitivity. That um, relationship, one treatment to many. Uh, uh, mechanisms we call mechanistic heterogeneity. And uh, that, as I've just argued, poses a problem uh, for context sensitivity. Furthermore, we also find that there is what we call mechanistic overlap. That is, different treatments sometimes share um, a mechanism. Huh? So what you see here is that uh, Commitment, for example, might operate in some such, some cases through social pressure. Uh, in particular, when commitment is made public, um, so then uh, it might be exactly the peer pressure that leads people to stick to it. Social comparison, in some cases, might operate through social pressure. So we have here a similar or maybe the same mechanism operating for social comparison as well as for commitment. Not in all cases, mind you, because we have mechanistic heterogeneity, but we're also seeing that sometimes uh, these uh, mechanisms overlap. And um, that leads us to argue that people with that, instead of categorizing behavioral public policies by treatment type, they should be categorized by mechanism type. No? So that, this is the... Um, this is the theoretical argument. This is the, the worry that we're basically uh, miscategorizing uh, the uh, uh, behavioral public policies because what matters are mechanisms um, and the current categorization practice largely disregards them. 
Now, how do we implement this? This is where uh, nudging and boosting uh, comes in. Yeah? So uh, we nudging and boosting are examples of how, based on mechanistic considerations, uh, we are proposing uh, separation, a categorization of what so far, as in the uh, in uh, the pie chart I showed you before, was all going into this non-coercive, non-incentivizing uh, uh, piece of pie. And of course, Thaler and Sunstein, um, we have been uh, in extensive discussion with Sunstein, um, so, uh, are interested in maintaining it that way. They like to be in control of um, the concept that covers it all. We believe that um, that they deserve recognition for uh, the, their pioneering work, but, but that there are other reasons why uh, one wants to cleave that pie um, into smaller bits. So we retain the notion, the, the term nudge for some kinds um, within this uh, category, but we're saying some other types um, um, must be separated from it. Here's some examples, just to, so, uh, so far I've spoken rather abstractly. Um, so a typical nudge in our view is uh, to reset a default. A default uh, or, uh, consists in uh, determining what people will get if they don't make an active choice. For example, uh, when a company um, has a, a, a retirement uh, contribution scheme, this is more common in the US than in Europe, most European countries, um, then they uh, will ask their, um, uh, their employees how much they will want to contribute um, to such a scheme. And inevitably, there will be some people who will not get around answer. So uh, that in order to then get the scheme going, you have to define, uh, you have to specify a particular date until you'll take uh, um, employees' uh, answers. And after that, you have to decide what those who haven't answered uh, will get. This might be this zero, or it might be um, another number. Now you might say, okay, those who haven't answered, they get... Uh, three percent. They we will retain three percent of their salary for retirement scheme. And uh, the graph you see here, uh, the bar chart shows an example where uh, of, a, of a of actually an experiment where a company that had a three percent default then uh, was motivated by experimenters to switch to a six percent default. Yeah, so it's a it's a quasi experiment because it, there's no there's no control, but instead there's a before after uh, uh, treatment, and you see that the distribution of um, um, uh, of uh, how, what people ended up with uh, differs a lot. Yeah? So we generally can see, we see this across a wide range of uh, applications that about twenty five percent of uh, the population. Um, changes uh, their choices based on a change in default. Nothing else changed, right? There was no, there was, they, they, they didn't force people's hands. People could choose whatever they wanted before, before, after, but a lot of people ended up with a different contribution than before. Um, similarly, there's a, there's a so-called um, uh, uh, save more tomorrow intervention which uh, aims to um, increase uh, people's savings. Um, this is now not necessarily for retirement, it simply uh, is a response to the worry that people don't generally don't save enough. Um, and uh, what they find is uh, that uh, if one asks people to, um, the, to, to um, specify saving rates, a long time before they actually receive the money, instead of asking them at the time when they have the money in their hand, then saving rates will go up. And um, this is expl explainable uh, by, uh, the, uh, by hyperbolic discounting, so that we don't um, uh, 
discount in a lit, uh, discount uh, the value of uh, future consumption in a linear fashion, but that there are um, moments when uh, we'd rather um, have a sooner and uh, much smaller reward uh, than a later and much bigger reward, um, as long as we're sufficiently close to the sooner reward. Yeah, so you see this here. Um, this blue uh, line is a sooner but smaller reward. The, the, the vertical, the height is the concerns the, and the degree of how much of a reward it is. And um, these two lines, when seen from a distance, are clearly um, the, the yellow line uh, is higher than the blue line, thus indicating that uh, uh, agents evaluate the yellow as higher than the blue. But as they're approaching uh, the blue line, at some point, these two lines cross, and that's where um, people begin uh, evaluating the smaller but sooner reward higher than uh, the larger but later reward. And the Save More Tomorrow uh, intervention tries to get people out of this um, particular area. Yeah? They try to sort of push, basically, the decision uh, back um, to an extent where people are still evaluating the larger but later reward, reward more highly than the uh, uh, sooner but smaller reward. So these are two examples, I believe, of not just, and I'll later on explain why um, I categor we categorize them. So, and here are two examples of boosts. One um, concerns an intervention on marital quality. Yeah, so that's concern. So um, it's apparently uh, a well in, in in the literature a well recognized effect that the that the quality of marriage only knows one direction and that is down. So people are happiest when they're newly married and from there on. Um, and, uh, but you can, uh, you, uh, you can actually stop that development through um, well-designed uh, interventions. Um, an intervention of it's, I really like it because it's very, a very simple one, consists in training people to um, take on in a in a uh, marital conflict situation to take on a third person's perspective like a friend or an acquaintance who is looking onto you and you sort of you're assuming that perspective for a moment, for a moment. you ask what would, if my friend were here right now what would he do or what would he think about us uh, quarreling like this um, and this takes about, it takes about five minutes to explain to people and the, the experimental intervention then makes people uh, write a short essay that takes another 10 minutes to sort of that, to check that they really understood uh, and also make sure that, that people remember. Um, and um, the, the, it's notable um, in uh, these, the, these are self-reported, uh, self-report data on marital equality that the quality um, remark, sort of uh, actually increases after the intervention while it continues decreasing uh, in the control group. Uh, that who got a, who also got a who got a similar task, also writing an essay, but didn't get the get, didn't get the boost, didn't get the the, the particular tip how to deal with marital conflict. Another example I think is uh, nice is um, a simple physical intervention uh, for um, uh, uh, in, for improving small business accounting discipline. So this concerns um, small businesses in uh, less developed countries where formal education is often very low and where it's very difficult to teach even uh, relatively basic accounting rules. So uh, what the researchers did here was to propose to business owners to physically separate their business proceeds from their, from their personal uh, proceeds. Uh, so those people often operate with just with cash um, and cash is stored somewhere and instead of storing it in one place, you store it now in two different places, depending on whether this is coming from your income, let's say from selling fruits in your fruit store versus uh, money that, you, that you're spending 
on um, your household items in your family. Um, control group, they, were, they had a control group that where they, they didn't get any, who didn't get anything. And they had another control group who got uh, half a year's course in uh, basic accounting. And uh, according to their measures of business uh, accounting discipline, this simple physical separation intervention um, improved business discipline uh, a lot more than either of the other two uh, treatments. So um, here we have two examples of boost. And now I want to explain to you with the help of a relatively simple scheme, how, why I believe uh, that the boosts and nudges uh, differ. So let's start thinking about sort of what is sort of the minimal kind of choice or minimal model, caricature model of choice that involves uh, a number of alternatives, some kind of selection rule, um, and um, that then, then picks out uh, one of the alternatives as uh, the choice. In standard decision theory, we typically also think of these alternatives having a number of different properties and the selection rules being based on evaluations of these properties, right? So we have something like a standard that you would think like a utility function that picks up on the properties of these different alternatives. But that, that doesn't have to be, right? The selection rule can also be, can be on, uh, on other aspects. Um, one thing that standard decision theory largely ignores is that some, the, the information about alternatives and these properties must come from somewhere. So agents actually have the problem of, they need to search their environment for relevant information, what the alternatives are and what their properties are. And uh, this probably takes more time than actually performing the decision itself, right? You need to, first of all, gather. And decision theory, we typically see, well, we the decision problem, say the decision problem has already been specified. Now we can discuss how the decision is taken. But the specification of this decision problem is a big issue and it requires that people engage with their environment in certain ways and involve certain search rules. Now, one thing that behavioral economics or more broadly behavioral science has contributed, and I think one of the most fundamental things is to say, wait a moment, you're talking about the environment as if it was basically just a pot of relevant information that the agent is searching for. And that's not true. But instead, they argue there is some part of the environment that is information, that is what is what could what a rational uh, agent could consider to be relevant information for uh, their choice problem. And then there's a lot of other bits in the environment, factors in the environment that are considered to be irrelevant, but nevertheless, um, they're there. And interestingly, we can show that they have a causal influence on both search as well as uh, the selection. So ultimately on choice. And this is where all these considerations of frames, defaults, temporal positions, and so on come in. Yeah, you can't really, as an agent, you wouldn't say the uh, the, I mean, in there are some exceptions, but in most cases, you would say, well, the default that was set is not relevant information for me. Huh? It's a, what, ma what matters are the alternatives and uh, what their properties are. So why am I, why I wouldn't take into account what the default is. I wouldn't take into account what stands on top of a list or what stands on the bottom. I wouldn't take into account when I take the, when I take the decision um, uh, in comparison to when uh, the decision is implemented, but instead I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I can disregard those bits of information as being irrelevant, and yet it has been shown that they are uh, causally influential. And this is, and, and this simple scheme is enough to now distinguish a number of uh, types of interventions. Um, uh, through which uh, behavioral public policies can operate. So going back to the earlier pie, I talked about coercion. Coercion affects the available alternatives. It just er it eliminates some alternatives that are now not open to me anymore to choose. 
incentivization changes the properties of some of the alternatives, right? So it makes some profit and some alternatives more expensive or less expensive, or maybe there are other ways how to make them, make them more sexy or uh, less attractive, wh whatever it might be. Informing concerns uh, presenting information that uh, otherwise would need to be searched or could be overlooked in a way that makes it more easily searchable. These are, I'm just giving you those as a sort of little background information to see that this scheme is actually quite powerful to distinguish different uh, types of interventions that that's not really something that is needed for my argument, because I'm only interested in distinguishing nudges versus boosts, and this is coming now. So nudges are those interventions that intervene on the context that is not informationally relevant for the uh, individual, but that has been shown to be causally effective on uh, selection, on search or selection. So think of um, think of the um, uh, the default setting or uh, the save more tomorrow. Those that intervened on the choice architecture, on the context, um, on those factors that have been shown to have an effect on choice, even though um, the individual would disregard them as uh, informationally inert. The boost, in contrast, aims to chain, to adjust the uh, search and selection rules. And it does so uh, with regard to the environment in which the agent uh, finds itself. So it's important to sort of not say, well, there's, there is one universally best search um, and universally best selection rule, but rather the goodness of such rules will depend in many cases on the environment. Uh, so um, for example, uh, it, it makes sense to propose to people who have very little formal education to divide their proceeds in, into two physically different places. While you wouldn't necessarily want to do that you might find better ways of teaching, of helping people to improve business uh, discipline in situations where people have more formal uh, formal education, uh, where where people know basic arithmetic. Um, it might be more effective to teach uh, uh, standard accounting rules. Uh, so this is a this is an example of a context dependent goodness. Uh, you want to. Um, so, but for such contexts, um, I would argue um, we are the boost um, sort of affecting the search rule, like 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 the um, uh, the the the, the separating the proceeds uh, um, uh, are an effective way of changing behavior. So, I've now given you sort of a mechanistic motivation for distinguishing nudges and boosts. And uh, we are, uh, so we're saying that not just strategically harness biases or the choice architecture, yeah? the known fact factors that are known to affect behavior without being seen as informationally relevant. Yeah? And thus affecting either what information is searched or what uh, alternatives are selected for. Boost in contrast, um, foster competences. So they make people more competent uh, by, uh, by providing them with new or by, uh, by suggesting to them to exchange already existing uh, rules of thumb that fit um, uh, the environment in order for them to pursue their goals. And um, uh, so this concerns uh, a matter of training. Okay, so now I've given you this, um, these, uh, the, 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 the basic motivation for why we think that we need to categorize uh, behavioral public policies more fine grainedly than simply talking about nudges. And we've given you also uh, the basis for, for how we are dividing this, namely by identifying mechanistic differences uh, between these types. Now let me show you two um, domains where we have applied this uh, distinction and I think we've got some good results. The first is to experimentally compare 
nudges versus boosts. So we've done this last year here at uh, my home university um, and uh, specifically in student housing where we, uh, where we uh, did, where we designed three intervention types. One was a simple informing uh, intervention. So people were provided with information, but they had to do all the searching and sort of processing themselves. Uh, then there was a nudge that, uh, that, that made, where we asked people to commit, where we uh, told them how much progress they had made on the commitment, where they gotten weekly uh, consumption feedback, where they got social comparisons, and where they got generally weekly reminders about, about, about uh, their uh, consumption and so on. And then the other hand, there were boosts that we implemented a boost where we um, uh, fitted their apartments with um, little stickers, QR code stickers, so they could scan different devices and learn um, a, which of these devices were energetically um, uh, more efficient. And secondly, that we provided them with ways how to make use of them. So for example, uh, microwave, cooking with a microwave is a lot more energy efficient than cooking on a stovetop or in the oven, but most people don't know how to cook with a microwave. Many people, in fact, believe that you cannot cook with a microwave, which is uh, not true. You can actually do a lot of things with a microwave, but you need particular recipes, and the people typically didn't don't have these recipes, so we provided them with that. So there was every week there was a new recipe that they could uh, draw with their uh, with their telephone from the microwave sticker um, and something similar happened with other things like the shower or the lights or the the, um, the, the, the wall plugs etc etc so um, we were interested both in what were the different effect sizes for nudges and boosts in particular and we were interested in whether but well, we also wanted to check whether indeed uh, nudges and boosts operated through different mechanisms. And this is empirically very difficult. It's not easy, right? It's not, you can't observe mechanisms. So you can only observe what we call mechanistic markers. So they're, they're sort of, you have to have a model um, where you say, well, look, here are the different mechanisms. And now we can identify certain points, certain uh, mediators, you might say, or sometimes even certain side effects. Uh, that show that, that this effect actually operated through this mechanism rather than the other one. And um, what we found was the following. We did a number of uh, static uh, measures. So we observed that um, for the three treatment groups, uh, the, the nudge uh, participants and, and engaged a lot more in social comparison. Um, the boost uh, participants engage a lot more with the information provided than the other two treatment groups. And um, interestingly enough, it was the, the information um, uh, treatment that engaged most with um, uh, the uh, feedback. Um, and then we had also two um, uh, diachronic um, observations, namely we checked whether people, to what, ex to what extent did people adjust the, their view about what a realistic goal was, and it was only the nudge group that engaged uh, with this uh, realistic, they, that they actually uh, adjusted their, uh, uh, their judgment, what a realistic goal was down considerably, because they were engaging with it. And we also asked whether people felt capable of uh, executing uh, certain behaviors necessary to uh, save energy. And um, it was only uh, the boost condition that felt uh, participants uh, that uh, increased kind of their uh, judgment in this way. So these were markers. I mean, this is this worked a little bit more. This worked a little different. We pre-registered this trial and we made a number of predictions regarding these mechanisms and mechanistic markers. Um, and the, the data largely um, uh, uh, supported our predictions. So we believe that the uh, mechanisms indeed were operating as we had hypothesized. And now um, you can see uh, the difference in effect sizes. We, uh, uh, on the left side, you see the 
accumulated um, consumption. This is over um, uh, 27 years, a good half year um, of living in, in student dorms. Um, so the nudge uh, participants consume most and the boost cons uh, participants cons consume least. And the difference between these two is statistically significant. Um, and if you look on the right side, you see how consumption developed um, throughout this uh, experimental period. And we, you see that um, the notch condition generally uh, in, all in all periods state of uh, uh, the, the notch participants consume in more in all periods uh, than the boost uh, participants did. Um, so we we conclude that a there the mechanistic distinction that we theoretically drew uh, is supported by empirical findings, and furthermore we see um, that there is substan there is substantial difference in effect sizes between these different categories. So this is an example of how we are making use of a theoretical concept. Uh, for empirical purposes and actually and, the, and letting the empirical um, evidence um, actually help us support uh, these uh, theoretical uh, distinctions. And now um, let me, if I still have some time, I think we started a quarter past or something, right? So yeah, that's, that, that's good. Um, so let me give you an example of how these um, uh, this, these, these category, categorical distinctions work with for uh, a normative assessment. Uh, so um, I'm, give, I'm here, I'm focusing on the concept of autonomy. What I'm th thinking of when I talk about autonomy is uh, a form of uh, self-rule that's local in the sense that it can be, I can be autonomous in one area, let's say, um, when uh, going shopping, but I'm non-autonomous when I'm when it comes comes to my uh, choosing uh, internet content consumption, for example. So it's not it's not a it's not it's not an individual who's either autonomous, non-autonomous, but it's autonomous with respect to certain behavior. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, uh, importantly. Um, it's about uh, it's not the Kantian uh, notion of autonomy that is high that is highly idealistic, but it's uh, it's something that we actually can easily we can achieve at least to a degree, um, and that supports our legal responsibility, equal political standing, and uh, against the barrier of uh, paternalism. Uh, so it's not a it's something that we would point out that a lot of people would have, at least in some areas of their life. Um, and that's why uh, the, we, we have, uh, the, for example, the democratic institutions that we have. Um, and um, I'm defining autonomy reduction as, uh, as a loss of a degree of such uh, self-rule in some uh, area of life. Um, and I'm arguing that it is not a, a behavioral consequence of the, of the intervention, but rather a property of its procedures. So it's not that you can determine whether some, someone's change, I mean, an intervention changing your behavior doesn't mean that you lose autonomy just because something influenced you. You can be influenced in ways that leaves your autonomy entirely intact. Um, and then there are other ways how uh, you can be influenced and change your behavior and that affects your, affects your autonomy or reduces your autonomy. So we cannot tell from uh, that, uh, that uh, behavioral public policy um, has a massive, massive effect on your behavior that it is autonomy reducing, but rather we need to look into uh, the procedures of how this uh, intervention uh, does that. Now, um, the problem here is that <clears throat> there's no general agreement what 
uh, how to um, what autonomy is and how the autonomy can be reduced. So I'm I'm taking a pluralist account here. I'm basically ta I'm taking the most prominent notions of autonomy and uh, uh, from the literature, and I'm translating them into autonomy reduction for each. And um, then I'm showing that uh, the nudge type intervention um, tends has a has at least uh, implies the possibility of autonomy reduction for each, while the boost intervention type does not. And that's where I derive a normative conclusion about boost versus nudge four. So here. Are to here are the uh, the different accounts, so we might consider uh, the uh, an event E reducing an agent's autonomy um, uh, if um, E increases the the incoherence of uh, the agent's uh, preferences. Alternatively, if E reduces A's ability to pra of practical reasoning. Alternatively, uh, uh, if E reduces A's ability to appreciate and understand the reasons they have for a particular action. Um, sorry, yes, those three. And now I want to sort of ch compare boosts and nudges with respect to these three accounts. So let me start with by going through nudges. Nudges employ causal factors that I argue cannot be reasons for action. Uh, so um, the they they are harnessing the contextual factors that are inform that are that the agent considers to be informationally inert and therefore Tate does not take into account in her uh, decision making. Yet they are causally effective. Huh? Like for example, you shift someone's decision making uh, the moment when they make a decision with respect to, uh, in relation to uh, the implementation of. Uh, that uh, decision, when you would ask people what were your reasons that you, cho that you chose to make a certain amount of saving, um, they would not, uh, they would uh, presumably not give the that temporal position as their reason. If they gave the temporal position as their reason, I, I, I doubt that it would be considered to be a rational uh, argument for, in particular, given that the, with a change of temporal position, um, the the decision would change. So, um, not just here employ causal factors that cannot be reasons, and that arguably amounts to a reduction of the ability to appreciate reasons for one's action. Now, furthermore. Uh, when we can argue, when we ask about the uh, uh, the practical reasoning ability, then not just circumvent practical reasoning, because they're making use of uh, causal factors that are not part of causal reason of uh, uh, practical reasoning. Like, for example, when um, uh, changing the default, people are not. Encourage, through that, encourage to think about what the proper um, what the what the proper contribution for their purposes would be. Rather, um, is it is something that is otherwise entirely informationally um, inert. It does not provide new information about what people should do. Rather, I mean, what contribution people should choose. Rather. Um, it um, just changes um, the the uh, result that they stuck that they stick with in most cases because they simply never get around choosing at all, right? So instead of encouraging people to reason through to a choice, it's a, in fact the default require. And I mean, under the standard assumption of what the mechanism is through which it operates, it it requires that a lot of people will never actually get around reasoning through this at all because they just they get stuck in the reasoning they don't know and because they don't know they end up with what they'll get if they don't make a choice at all 
Okay, and the third one um, was increasing um, uh, preference incoherence. And here, um, what we see is that uh, the nudge plays um, plays out the the uh, the harnessing of biases, the causal factors that they harness against uh, practical reasoning conclusions. Uh, so people might have some reasons for choosing a certain. Uh, uh, for 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 choosing a certain amount to contribute, but they're now they're now the 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 nudges harnessing factors uh, that are not part of this reasoning. There might be um, an increase in the uh, clashes, a conflict between what people uh, might uh, uh, rationally come to conclude would be the best for them and um, what they're drawn by those factors. Now contrast this with um, the, oh, and here's an example, actually. I meant, I meant to uh, give that to you. So uh, it's again, it's a default uh, setting uh, question. And uh, you might be aware of this. It was, it was quite popular a while ago question of uh, whether uh, organ donation should operate through an opt-in or an opt-out. Huh? So whether one should, so in Germany, for example, um, you, in order to become an organ donor, you need to uh, make an explicit statement to some kind of agency, or you need, at least you need to carry an explicit statement with you. Um, so all that uh, when you um, are severely injured, um, you can be considered uh, to be a potential organ donor. In Austria, in contrast, um, everybody is considered an organ donor unless they explicitly write to, an, to uh, the relevant agency and say, I don't want to be an organ donor. Unsurprisingly, perhaps there are hugely different uh, numbers of organ donors in Austria and Germany. Um, Germany has about 12% 12 12 of the population registered as donors. Germ uh, Austria has about 99% registered as donors. So you might, and this is often touted as an example of how successful default setting can be. If you look at effective donor um, uh, numbers, you see that there is a difference. So um, in Germany, uh, there are 15 actual donors per, so of course, just being a registered donor doesn't mean that you'll actually be a donor because the conditions under which you can become a donor are very, are very rare. Um, but um, so in Germany, there are 15 actual donors per million inhabitants and in Australia, there are 24. But interestingly, there's a huge mismatch between the reg registered donors and the number of actual donors. And both countries, I should say, suffer from uh, a lack of donors, right? It's not as if, oh, well, we didn't need more. Um, so something's ha something happened here, and we know what, which is that uh, the Austrian hospitals, which are the ultimate arbiters in these, in these cases, uh, of course know that 99% of the population aren't willingly, uh, haven't willingly agreed to be donors. So they just never got around writing this letter saying, I don't want to be a donor. So what they do is they, they, they now you have someone with uh, severe brain damage lying uh, on the operation table and you have an hour um, to harvest their organs. And uh, what do you do? You uh, contact their family and you say, what did these people actually want? And then in most cases, the families say, well, they, of course they didn't want their, their organs to be distributed all over the place. So what we find here is that sort of there's, a, there's a conflict, right? The, the, the nudge harnesses the default setting in Austria in order to get a lot of people registered. But then their behavior actually is not necessarily in, uh, in coherence. Uh, their, their preferences is not in coherence with this. And this is what we find out when we, uh, when we talk to the families, that they, the families that at least claim that, um, uh, that the, the potential donor actually did not want to become a donor and just did, never got around uh, sort of uh, uh, making that preference, uh, preference hurt. So this is the sense, or this is one example of how I believe that how nudges can increase the incoherence 
um, between uh, uh, between uh, preferences as recorded through a nudge versus uh, the uh, reasoning conclusion uh, uh, that the individuals themselves uh, might have made. Now let's compare this to um, the notion of boost um, and go through the same, I'm starting at the bottom again. Uh, boosts provide competences that agents can employ to appreciate reasons for acting. They don't, uh, they don't need to use these competences in order to uh, formulate their reasons for acting in this way. So we are providing people with uh, the idea that to physically separate proceeds, that doesn't mean that they therefore have a necessary, so for that each of them now have a reason to actually do so, but they, if they understand um, what this is about, if they understand what the effect of this might be, and if they understand that this is in their own interest, if it is, then they might take this competence as a reason for acting in this way. So the boost provides an instrument um, that can be uh, used. And if it is used, it will be used for reasons because we have no way, the boosters have no way how to force people to do this. This uh, relates um, this relates to the second uh, consideration in me of the practical reasoning ability. The boost exclusively operates through practical reason. The booster had, must co-opt the uh, individual's um, uh, choice and their, and their motivation at at least three stages. Yeah? So a booster comes and says, look, we have this idea um, how to help you overcome uh, marital strife. At that moment, you might say, I don't suffer from marital strife. I'm, I'm happy in my relationship. I don't need help from you. Uh, or I might need help, but um, or I, I am actually uh, having a lot of conflict, but I'm enjoying it, whatever, right? So I don't want your, I don't want to hear what you have to say. First stopgap. Second stopgap, someone who acquired who listened to the booster and listened to the intervention, wrote the essay and understand what this is about, um, um, still refuses um, to take this on. Huh? So right, listens to you, writes the essay and the end says, this is nonsense, this doesn't work, I'm not interested in this, um, and uh, drops it, the se second stopgap. Third stopgap, um, uh, the, per the participant um, has, listened to you, engaged with it, accepted it as, as relevant and, a, and, and a, a plausible and perhaps helpful uh, suggestion, but in the context of a particular conflict, decides not to apply, refuses to take on a third person perspective, says, this conflict, I really need to, I, I need to work out in, from my perspective, not from anybody else's perspective. So we have th different stop gaps where the individual will need to actively embrace the boost, the boost content and the boost implementation. Otherwise, um, the behavior, the boost cannot change the behavior. This active embrace is a form of, it requires a form of practical reasoning. Thus, boosts operate exclusively through practical reasoning. There's no way how we can boost you uh, without you knowing or without you accepting the boost as something that you think is relevant and acceptable. And therefore, um, because it operates through practical reasoning, it is very unlikely to increase attitude incoherence because we need to refer to some attitudes that people have. People must have seen that they were that they disliked their uh the, the the severity of their conflicts in their marriage um in order to be even interested in listening to someone who says here's a way how you could reduce that otherwise they will not do it therefore um there will be unless they already suffered from preference incoherence before 
um, there is their boost will not be able to um, or will not contribute to um, an increase in preference agreements. So to conclude, nudge mechanisms um, at least have the, the possibility to systematically reduce autonomy. It does, they don't have to. I, I, this is actually a little bit too strongly uh, formulated. The important thing is that the, the nudge mechanism has the potential to substantially reduce autonomy, even if in many cases it will not do so. The boost mechanism, in contrast, um, will not does not have the potential to uh, systematically reduce autonomy. And that, again, I think is, um, I mean, first of all, I think it's an interesting uh, normative result. Secondly, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it shows, it showcases how um, the distinct, the conceptual distinction between, between nudge and boost um, is fruitful for uh, normative discussion. Okay, so to conclude, I um, offered a categorization of behavioral public policies by treatment um, and uh, showed how boosts and nudges can be theoretically distinguished based on mechanistic considerations. And then I showed how this can be uh, experimentally um, implemented as well, uh, and also how this can help uh, to uh, in normative analysis. Thank you.